they don't do what's traditionally here in Australia. And I was thinking, a little bit while, a while ago, there were some people also came in boats, and they also didn't honour the culture of the people here. In fact, they shoved them off the land, they stole their land, they took their children away, and they murdered those people. So I think we should just always have an open heart for refugees and not have these silly kind of prejudices. For this reason then also, I want to say that I want to acknowledge the tradition and respect the traditional owners of this land and pay respect to the elders past and present who defended their land, land that was stolen and never ceded. I would also like you now to introduce you to my co-chair Hadi, who is also a Hazara refugee. Welcome Hadi, he's also going to introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much to be here. Your support shows that the people who come to this country for help and got some negative answer from the government and we are here to supporting them. The reality is the nature of human, when people can't understand something, they won't accept it. And we are here today that because we understood. We understood those people need help. Refugee didn't come to this country because Australia got a very good TV show. They come here because there's someone shooting on them. I would love to introduce the first speaker, Gary Zadkwish. Please welcome Gary. I too would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to Aboriginal elders past and present, to Aboriginal people with us today, and of course, non-Aboriginal citizens. We should always come together on occasions like this in a spirit of reconciliation and pay our respects to the traditional owners of this land. Today I represent the 60,000 members of the New South Wales Teachers Federation. We are affiliated to the Australian Education Union, our national union, which comprises 180,000 public education teachers and education workers. As public education teachers, we have a deep and abiding commitment to the well-being of all children. As public education teachers, we have a profound sense of responsibility to care for our students and to educate them to the best of our ability. The New South Wales Teachers Federation is dedicated to the pursuit of human rights, equality and social justice for all people, regardless of one's race, culture, nationality, religion or socioeconomic status. We members of the New South Wales Teachers Federation are therefore appalled at the treatment of refugees and asylum seekers by the major political parties of Australia. And indeed, yesterday, 300 teachers from all around New South Wales gathered at the State Council of the Federation. And we endorsed unanimously this policy position which will be conveyed to the Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, and the opposition leader, Tony Abbott. And our decision reads like this. The New South Wales Teachers Federation condemns the recent policy decision of the federal government, which will see all asylum seekers arriving by boat detained in Papua New Guinea and any asylum claims processed in that country. Those granted refugee status will be resettled in Papua New Guinea. Clearly, this is a dramatic worsening of Australia's position on refugees. It follows many months of the Leader of the Opposition deliberately using fear and xenophobia 
to divide the community. The Teachers' Federation believes that this policy clearly contravenes Australia's obligations under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, as well as the United Nations Refugee Convention. Australia's recent history on asylum seekers is a sorry one. Following the 2001 Tampa crisis, the Howard government initiated the Pacific Solution to enable Australia to avoid its international obligations by processing refugees and asylum seekers offshore. The defeat of the Howard government in 2007 was welcomed as an opportunity to redress the damage done to Australia's international reputation by developing a more humane and acceptable refugee policy. However, by May 2011, the number of children in detention rose under the Gillard government and a proposed Malaysian solution was developed. In 2012, there was a return to offshore processing on the UN condemned Manus Island and Nauru facilities. In May 2013, the Australian mainland was excised as a migration zone. The Federation is particularly concerned with the ongoing damage these policies are having on the health and well-being of the children of asylum seekers, as well as unaccompanied minors. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child requires states to act in the best interests of the child. The Teachers' Federation believes that Australia is not honouring the terms of the Convention. The Teachers' Federation calls on both major political parties to develop refugee policies that would allow Australia to honour its moral and legal obligations to ensure that asylum seekers, their families and their children are treated humanely. The Federation will continue... The Federation will continue to work in alliance with community groups to publicise this issue in the lead in to the federal election. So on behalf of the teachers of New South Wales public schools, TAFE colleges and other public education providers, I say this to you. We public education teachers stand in solidarity with all Australian citizens who believe that we should extend humanitarianism compassionate and caring aid to all of those who would seek to come to this land, this land of plenty, this land of opportunity, this land of prosperity. We should reach out a helping hand and welcome all citizens who seek nothing more than a better life and a safe and secure future for themselves, their families and their children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. I have such an important message to get from the Teachers uh, Union Federation. Um, and we have a long, long list of actually unions as well as organisations that have supported this rally. And I'll just start reading some out for you. Meanwhile, we are trying to make a phone hookup with Papua New Guinea. And we're going to have somebody speaking to you from Papua New Guinea. We've heard that there are a lot of protests happening there as well among students and people in general who are saying, don't dump your refugees on us. And we know that the Australian government actually has an official warning for Australian citizens planning to travel to, to Papua New Guinea, saying to them they have to take extreme caution, extreme caution indeed, because their personal safety cannot be guaranteed, because they are endemic, um, diseases in Papua New Guinea such as malaria, HIV and cholera and many more. UNICEF has regards Papua New Guinea as one of the most dangerous countries for children. The list goes on. I'm sure Papua New Guinea themselves say they're not happy with the situation but they feel that they're being totally exploited by the heavy-handed attempt by Australian government to force refugees on them for their own political gain. You will hear soon from one of these speakers themselves. I'll just quickly read you from our list of people that support us. Amnesty International, Australian Youth Environmental Network, Children Out of Detention, Community Action Against Homophobia, Green Left Weekly, 
Indigenous Social Justice Association, Hazara Youth Perspective, Jews Against Occupation, Labour for Refugees National and New South Wales, and Macquarie Uni University Students Against Racism. I will continue the list a little bit later. Okay, here's your man from Papua New Guinea. Please welcome Graham Robinson, a former Secretary for Health from Papua New Guinea. Graham. Australia, Sydney, Australia. Uh, good afternoon to you all in Sydney, Australia. I would uh, also like to thank the organizers for having me as a citizen in this country, participate and contribute to our cause. What you are doing in Sydney represents a shared concern by both the people of Papua New Guinea and Australia. As we oppose the assignment deal signed two weeks ago by the Prime Minister of our country. Firstly, I must, I, must, I must make it clear that Australia's regional resettlement agreement between Kevin Rudd and Peter O'Neill does not represent the interest of the citizens in Papua New Guinea. You see, the signing of the RRA does not represent me, my family, and my people in the district of my home province because it carries with it cross-cutting issues, especially when it's in breach of the 1951 Geneva Convention on Human Rights, where abuse has been cited and will continue, not by Australia and Papua New Guinea, but by two individuals we must name, Kevin Rudd and Peter O'Neill. As I speak, as I speak, there is a lot of discontentment amongst the general population in Papua New Guinea that is expressed on mainstream media and also, also on social media here. Even MPs in Parliament are not happy on both sides, both the opposition and the government. And it is also known that the members of Parliament within the government are scared to speak out with, a, with fear of getting dumped without funding by Papua New Guinea's Prime Minister, Peter O'Neill. The majority, the majority of Papua New Guineans are not happy with the current Prime Minister's ad hoc decision, type decision making in this country. On Friday last week, the university students were stopped at the university gates by police because they wanted to do a protest march to the Australian High Commission here in Port Mosby and pre present their petition. Other civil societies like NGO are also in support of the students and only time will tell whether a national rally and campaign takes effect to stop Peter O'Neill and Kevin Rudd's intentions on the asylum issue. The people in this country understand clearly Kevin Rudd's ploy that ended Australia's first female Prime Minister's political career in a desperate attempt to salvage the Labour government solution to the asylum issue with hope to win in the coming Australian elections. We know Kevin Rudd's intentions because it represents character. The word here we must all know is character. The deal, the side deal between the two prime ministers reflects both their characters. This deal represents individual intentions and motives. It does not represent the interests, the best interests of both the people of Papua New Guinea and Australia. The silent deal has brought to life two people's character. The deal does not represent the interests of people in both countries. We are pushed into accepting change we do not want as people from both countries when it does not best serve our interests. The tactful approach in dealing with the asylum issue alone must single out the actions of the two Prime Ministers by the international community. Peter O'Neill has made numerous decisions that have not gone down well with the people in this country. And for him to conjure another deal that will continue to see the deprivation of human rights must be stopped at all, stopped at all costs. You see, sanity is needed at both local 
and international politics where equality and representation is supported by the people before anything else takes precedence. Both the people of Pakistani in Australia must be represented. If we think that the asylum deal is not right for us, why go ahead and sign a pact agreement? At the end of the day, we are all equal and must be treated equal. Leaders are in Parliament to represent us and not destroy us. That is the message that must be generated on a material. And your support in Sydney today, we hold close to heart here in Papua New Guinea and call you our brothers because of our long standing with history together. Thank you and I wish you all the best as we work to go together in stopping the abuse of human rights in the Pacific. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you for a speaker from Papua New Guinea. Our next speaker is from Hazara Youth Perspective, Shukufa Tahiri. Hazara are the people who've been persecuted in Afghanistan for a decade. Millions of Hazara moved to Iran and lived there, and the rest moved to Pakistan. They bought the land, they built their house, they built their city, but they are murdering every day. You're seeing in the news, in the media, and the one who moved to Iran, they met their family in there. They got children, but they never get support from the Iranian government. And they've been deported. Their children, their family, their men, they could leave their house and never back to their home. And the family could find out a month later that they've been deported to the country of Afghanistan. Please welcome Shukufa. We also have a rally next Saturday, 12 p.m., the same place, town hall. Thanks. My fellow Australians, have you heard of an abandoned community put to an endless ethnic cleansing and persecution? Do you know of a faithless community slaughtered for no reason except their selfless dedication to education, peacefulness and earnest services to their land? Do you know of a community whose existence is a crime purely as a result of their ethnicity? These attributes refer to a terrorized ethnic group, the Hazaras, who have a long, bitter history of persecution. I am Shaku Fatehiri. I'm a former refugee, a proud Australian now. I'm a member of the Hazara community, and as a Hazara, I'm shocked, appalled, and bewildered at the recent peak labor policy for the asylum seekers. Hazaras do form a large number of these border rivals. Let me tell you a little bit about the history of Hazara people, the minority group in Afghanistan. Hazaras are originally from Afghanistan. They have been living there for thousands of years. At the same time, for centuries, these people have been persecuted, oppressed by the Afghan regimes, such that in the 1890s, 63% of these people were completely perished by the regime of the time and by the tyrant of the time, Abdurrahman Khan. And the 37% who actually survived either stayed in the country and had to endure 
the successive Afghan regime's oppression on these people or they had to flee Afghanistan to bet neighboring countries like the Kuwait city of today, the Pakistan. Talibans are not the only people who attempted to remove the face of these people from the face of this world. This oppression has its historical roots. When 63% of this popul Hazar population were perished, it was not only the genocide, it was not only the mass genocide, their lands were taken also, they distributed among Gucci's. Surviving the mass genocide, surviving the Taliban massacres, these people thought they were finally safe in Kuwait, Pakistan, and so selflessly dedicated themselves to peacekeeping, education, and service to the new land. Hazaras in the last century have been pioneers of Pakistan, have protected Pakistan throughout its history, have won accolades for this country in boxing, athletics, and martial arts. Yet, the death and target killings pursue these unfortunate Hazaras absolutely everywhere, in avenues, markets, highways, university routes, shopping routes, and in local carriages. Just a few days ago, a few of Hazara people were shopping. They were targeted, singled out in the shopping route because they're distinct by facial appearance and they were shot. Hazaras have been marginalized, besieged on multiple fronts. Educationally, ethnically, Socially, when they're small vicinity in Quetta, where they're left alone and to die in their own. Hazara's youth have left universities, closed their businesses, and have ceased to carry on with their lives, waiting to be singled out and shot. The cries of wives who have lost their other halves, the cries of orphan children, mothers, and shattered families are echoed from every corner of the city, the Quetta city. Quetta is indeed being made a graveyard for Hazaras to which the authority closes eyes and subsequently denies any protection. It is this dying hope of protection, it is this fright and terror that compels these desperate human beings to give up everything and pursue the sea journey as it is nothing compared to what they have faced in their own homes. And this is where some head to Europe, some jump on a leaky boat where death is almost certain but they are driven by a tiny sparkle of hope that is so promising and yet so deceiving as the illusion it creates for some is death in disguise. Where the vulnerable people's lives are engulfed by the dangerous seas, while their dreams, aspirations, cries for help, flashbacks of their loved ones are buried with them deep down the ocean. The hope for safety ceases to remain a light. Yet the ones who do make it to our shores, exhaustfully pleading for protection, what do our politicians do? They turn their backs, label and represent these exhausted refugees as criminals. These refugees, having passed the most difficult hurdles, miseries and struggles life has thrown at them. But when they reach our shores, they are dumped in regional indefinite detention centers like Nairo and Manu Silence. Their already broken spirits are completely shattered. The indefinite detention center leave these people who are scarred with memories of persecution, damaged for life. And when they're not kept in detention centers, they are deprived from working rights in the community. They are deliberately deprived from the right of being self-reliant and an asset to this country. These refugees, are the boldest faces of humanity, of the most sincere kind who've passed the test of genocide, the test of persecution, the test of ethnic cleansing, the dangerous sea journey. They have passed the test of endurance and perseverance. Yet when they survive and reach our shores pleading for asylum, what do our politicians do? They dehumanize them by dumping them to die somewhere else, by sending them to Papua New Guinea where 51% of people live on less than $2 a day. A country who is 173rd for health, 
148 for death rates, 168 for life expectancy, 60% 60, 60 of the people have no clean water. Illiteracy is 43%, 55% of people in Papua New Guinea have no access to sanitation, 55% of kids have no access to education. So these poor people of PNG, Papua New Guinea, have the capacity to take refugees coming by boat. But we, we, the, one of the richest countries in the world, can't. Given, given that they only form 3% of the total migration intake by Australia, more than 90% of whom have been genuine refugees in the past. It is astonishing. Astonishing how self-serving our politicians have become, being so indulged in their football game that an ounce of humanity and empathy has ceased to exist in them. So determined to win, the, to win this political game that they're willing to manipulate, fee monger, brainwash the compassionate Australians by mythical cues, label the most vulnerable human beings as illegals and economic migrants and a burden in Australia. A burden. My father pursued the boat journey too in 1999. He was so forced to flee Afghanistan because of the Taliban. His life was in an immediate danger. He arrived in Australian shores. He was in a, on a temporary visa for five years. For in the fifth, 2005, he was granted his permanent visa. In 2006, we as a family could apply for asylum in Australia. In 2006, we started to settle in Australia and start a life here. My father and mother ever since have started a business where they employ dozens of other Australians to work in the business. My bigger brother is graduating from computer engineering, the other one civil engineering. I'm studying law and economics. My younger siblings are at their final years of high school. They are determined to pursue medicine. My little brother represented New South Wales in Australia in the 2008 Junior Pacific Games as a proud Australian. In fact, the majority of the refugee families are ambitious. Then how can a politician possibly, possibly justify and paint a picture of us as threatening to Australia? A burden and non contributing while we are wholeheartedly contributing, considering this our home. We, as Australians, believe Australia is built on the foundations of immig immigration and fair go. We are Australians are world renowned for our mateship and compassion and we have a proud history. We have boundless plans to share. Let's not allow our politicians divorce us from human empathy. And we will not let politicians succeed in their game and send us a century back into the white Australia policy. Yeah. Finally, you, every single one of you that are present here, have proved that Humanity prevails in the end, and we've all done that today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shokapa. What a fantastic speech. I'm so, so important because it's exactly what she has said, that the politicians want to drown out, trying to focus it on as though refugees are economic, here for economic reasons, as though it's a border issue, as though it's a national security issue, as though it is a fight the uh, people smugglers uh, business model, as though that's the most uh, terrible business model around. I want to just say a few things uh, to try and do these uh, rallies every week, which is getting people together and want their voices heard and not drowned out by politicians. Uh, it costs us some money. So right now, Refugee Action Coalition Sydney is sending a yellow bucket around. If you see this bucket, please give generously. We need some funds to keep going and also to uh, pay our costs. And that makes me think I really want to say a big thank you to Colin and Che, who've organized the uh, loudspeakers and, uh, uh, and, and the chocolate would have been out our, our uh, podium. But didn't quite work out. Thank you very much. We do what we can. We will not be stopped. That's the thing. It's ordinary people like us with ordinary means who are getting our voices heard and that's why we're doing it today. 
Just another thing though, before I ask our next speaker. You can see the next rally is next Saturday. I know um, Heidi has already announced it, but we have to keep repeating it. 12 p.m. Saturday, 10 August, next Saturday, here again. Please well, tell everybody there are posters for everyone to take with them and leaflets. Hand it out where you work, wherever you are. Put up posters in places where you think most people might not uh, otherwise see them because of the usual places where we uh, manage to put them up. We have to all try and get everybody going, get going, to send a message to politicians that there are other voices out there. Um, yeah, so our next speaker is Kate Fairman for the Greens of New South Wales. So I welcome her to come and tell you the only party that is officially speaking out for refugees. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for coming out today and for coming out last week and for coming out the week before that and hopefully for coming out every week until this government or the next winds back this outrageous, disgraceful, cruel policy on desperate for desperate people who are seeking asylum on our shores. We know that there are in fact millions millions of people across Australia who feel the same way you do. There are in fact millions of people in this country who are feeling ashamed, who are feeling extremely disappointed, in fact who are feeling incredibly angry at what a Labor Prime Minister has done what a Labor Prime Minister is doing to some of the world's most vulnerable people who are asking for our help. What Kevin Rudd has done would in fact make Pauline Hanson feel quite proud. Now we know when we look back at how we have got here, how on earth have we got here that we have a Labor Prime Minister doing this? Let's take this back to Pauline Hanson. Remember when Pauline Hanson said that we are in danger of being swamped by Asians? Remember when Pauline Hanson said in her first inaug in her inaugural speech, I, I can invite who comes into my lounge room, so surely we can also have a say in terms of who comes into this country. So what did we see after that But John Howard realised there was something in that? And John Howard in the 2001 federal election said, we will decide who comes into this country and the circumstances in which they come. And he knew that there was a small percentage, smaller than those who were outraged at this current policy, by the way, but he knew that he had touched something. Kevin Rudd has now adopted, as we know, the worst Liberal Party policy combined with Pauline Hanson that this country has ever seen. It's disgraceful. It is making everybody I speak to, and I've been uh, uh, touring uh, this state in regional New South Wales, in places like Tamworth, in places like Coffs Harbour, places like Wollongong, talking to people. And I tell you what, everybody, it seems, that talks to me about this from all walks of life and all political persuasions cannot believe what we are doing with this policy. So it is not just the people who are getting out and protesting every week, but I tell you what, your protest is so important because we are representing millions of people who feel so ashamed at the moment. Now let us remember as well what this is about. Are people fleeing persecution? People fleeing from countries like Afghanistan, countries like Iraq, countries like Sri Lanka, Syria, Iran, now, a couple of those countries, of course, 
the Australian government has had direct involvement in those conflicts, direct funding, direct involvement in those conflicts that people are fleeing. So what do we do but decide to send them away when they seek our help and seek a better life, send them away to Pacific Islands, ask countries like Nauru and PNG, essentially bribe them really with as much aid money as we can throw at them to get rid of this awful, apparently, issue for Kevin Rudd and for Tony Abbott. Now we know that I, I visited Billawood a couple of months ago and I spoke with an Iraqi man there who had come from Manus Island a month before and he was sick. It's the reason he had been uh, uh, he come back from Manus. He had bleeding kidneys because he was on a hunger strike. And he said when he found out that they were starting to process at that point some people from Manus and maybe he would have more luck getting resettled if he went back to Manus Island than stayed in, staying in Villawood. He said, not on your life. He was having nightmares about Manus Island. Every night he was, he was having nightmares about officers taking him back there. Out of everything that man has gone through in his life, to suddenly be in Manus Island, all of the conflict he has fled, all of the, uh, the borders, he, I cannot imagine what he has gone through. What was giving him nightmares was Manus Island. And what we are now doing as a country is so despicable. It is so despicable. The Greens continue to stand up for what is right and compassionate and fair and decent on this issue. And we will continue to talk to refugee advocates. We will continue to listen to the experts who actually want a solution, not a political fix. And we will continue to advocate for what is right and compassionate. We announced just this week our new policy, which is essentially what refugee advocates what the UNHCR, Amnesty International have been calling for in terms of dealing with this crisis, because it's a humanitarian crisis. It is not a border control crisis. We said that we would increase our humanitarian intake to 30,000 if the Greens policy was implemented, increase by a substantial amount the funding that goes to UNHCR so that they can process the desperate people who are waiting in Indonesia and Malaysia with no hope whatsoever but to board leaky boats. So the Greens congratulate all of you for continuing to speak out and be the voice for many, many millions of Australians who are feeling disgusted by what Kevin Rudd is doing. There's no point in talking about Tony Abbott because we know where he sits and I think the disgust is more that a Labor Prime Minister is doing this. I want to um, send some congratulations out to various organisations who are doing some really great stuff. The I Am A Boat Person uh, campaign is absolutely fantastic, well done. Uh, yesterday, the uh, Pitt Street Uniting Church had a, uh, serum, a uh, service, uh, which was incredible as well, a service in lament of the way we are treating refugees. Uh, that was uh, very moving and, and very inspiring for everybody who went there and also the Refugee Action Coalition, well done on continuing to organise these protests. They are absolutely essential. Give them all of your support. And uh, let's get out there every single week in the lead up to the federal election. And every single week in the lead up to the federal election. We need to make politicians' lives miserable about this policy. Let's make their lives miserable, both Labor and Liberal and National Party MPs who refuse to speak out for what is right here, they need to feel the heat on this. And until they feel the heat, they will not move. So that is your job and our job to continue doing this. One last push, the uh, welcome refugee mats. Uh, please get yours from the green stall over there because this is what this country should be doing. We should be welcoming people who are asking for our help. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kate. I hope those politicians will tremble and I hope our numbers will grow. 
Well, before we march, I just again have to remind you of a few things. I hope the bucket has reached you so far. Also, I wonder if you've managed to sign the petition that's at the Refugee Action Coalition table, sort of on the footpath near the street. Uh, it's really important. We also get a, pe a, a petition going uh, to hand into Parliament as soon as we can. Um, also, I want to advise you that if you want to take part in Refugee Action Coalition meetings to plan future rallies, information stalls, or just help with putting posters and leaflets out wherever you come from, uh, we meet every Monday night at 6 o'clock at number 33 Mary Street. Um, and that is in the building of the uh, uh, New South Wales Education uh, Department and Teachers Federation. Sorry, sorry. Teachers Federation. We will not forget it. The Teachers Federation on level one, and that's in Surrey Hills, but it's just uh, a block away from Central Station. Please come along and help us. The more people's inspiration and liveliness and energy we get, the better. So we are going to go and march, uh, but before we do so also, um, we have to wait for the main banner to get out into position. And then I have to I make another request. I got a phone call from the police who asked me that if anybody has banners or things uh, that have a few uh, expletives on it. I know it's hard to hold them in in the current political circumstances, but if you have the fuck word, or sorry, the F word on it or something. Sorry, what was that? Oh, it's so on my mind. Um, uh, you know, they, may, they will take them away from you. They insist that they are here to make sure that it all goes well for us, but they will take it away. I have said that I cannot tell you that you should do that. I feel we all come here from different backgrounds with different feelings within us. And I think, what is the biggest problem here? What is the most uh, horrible thing that's happening here? And that's the way the government and politicians are treating refugees. It is obscene. Yeah, the real obscenity is that people say, turn around the boats, that politicians want to send refugees to far off islands just so they don't come here. And they keep hinting that refugees are not real and that they try to make us forget about the humanitarian issue about it. It's a human rights issue and these are our universal human rights and if you start diminishing that, if you say human rights are, are don't apply to certain people, maybe because they come by boat or something like that, then they don't deserve those. Then we are all in trouble. It's not just about refugees, it's all of us. And our politicians are eroding our universal human rights values. So before we march, I want to urge you again, come next week, come to our meeting, and we are, when we finish marching, we are going to get together and sit down again and listen to the next speakers.
And so let's all move over there and uh, finish properly and then we will see each other again. So come with us. Free, free the refugees. Free, free the refugees. Free, free the refugees. Thank you. Our next speaker from Congo, Mombi Chilang Tenda. Please welcome him. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Uh, I apologize uh, to don't know uh, very well English, but uh, I think that uh, the most important thing is to understand what I would like to, uh, to tell you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Congolese. I am from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Democratic Republic of Congo is one of the biggest, the main country in Africa. We are just in the middle, in the middle of Africa. Uh, our country has been involved in the whole since 96. Since 96 until now, the whole is going, going, going every day, especially at the border of Congo and Rwanda. Uh, I would like to, to be brief to, because there is a lot of uh, things to do, uh, to, to speak about uh, Congo. I would like to congratulate everyone who came here today for this uh, uh, particular situation today. I think that uh, the decision of uh, Mr. Kevin Arad to close the uh, refugee to come here in Australia, I think that uh, it's not right. It's not right. Why it's not right? Because Australia is also involved in this situation that creates instability and terrorism in Asia when here in Australia people live uh, peacefully. So it's not correct to create uh, a conflictual situation outside and to refuse these people to come and to settle here. Yeah. I think that uh, the politicians of Australia have to see real, the real to see the real reason of these people and to be very, very uh, careful about this, uh, this uh, situation. Uh, Congo has been in conflict, as I say, since uh, 96. Ten, 10 million of people, 10 million people, not 10,000, 10 million people have been uh, killed in this uh, conflictual situation. But Australia and America and the uh, UK don't do anything uh, about this situation. And uh, it will be the same in Asia, the same Australia, UK and the USA and the other country will they continue to fight against people there to destroy people and here they are peaceful. It's not right. So thank you very much. I think that we are together and we will continue to fight until the solution will be uh, found. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mbui. Yeah, so many people all over the world have unimaginable problems and hardships. And our politicians would like to make us believe that we just have to be worried about our borders, our sacred borders. Um, so often people come to me and say, when I, during my activist life, oh, I'm not interested in politics. I hate politics. I don't take notice of it. And I agree. It's absolutely horrific. The sort of politics that goes on as practiced by current politicians is a totally, totally sick making and, yeah, gah. And anyway, but you are the real, this is politics. This, what you are doing here is the real politics. It's ordinary people speaking out. It is ordinary people being empowered. Ordinary people who make their voices heard. Yeah. We need more of it. And we need to engage those people who have been intimidated by the sort of rule and divide politics by all these main politicians. By the way, people are being frightened off because they're made to think that they're all wrong. We should empower those people as well. We should also those people who have been, uh, become apathetic, who feel, oh well, what can I do? I can do nothing. I'll just sit here. I'll leave it to somebody else. We should go and light the fire for them as well. So we have to have light those fires. Thank you. So don't forget, next Saturday, our next speaker is Mark Hoodkamp, who's been with Refugee Action Coalition since, I don't know, since it started in 1999. And he is going to light some more fires. Thank you. Thanks, Petra. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and reinforce the links between our Indigenous brothers and sisters and the most recent arrivals um, who are fleeing persecution. And many Aboriginal leaders have spoken out in support of refugees and said if we were running this country, people would be welcome. We've just heard news. Kevin Rudd has flown from Brisbane to Canberra today and I think I've just heard, I'm 99% sure that he has just called the election for the 7th of September. That means we have one month and one day, or one month and two days, three days, to, to really deepen and broaden this impressive movement that has erupted and re-gathered re its strength over the last couple of weeks. And we can do it. We can do it. We've shown with repeated turnouts at these demonstrations that there is a layer of people who are concerned. We have seen, in contrast to the parliamentary wing of the Labor Party, some people who were critical when Gillard was Prime Minister of Offshore Processing, like Doug Cameron here in New South Wales, like Melissa Park in Fremantle in WA, who, who is now the International Development Minister. Some of those people who were opposed to offshore processing are now completely towing the line in a most disgraceful fashion. But in contrast to that, in contrast to that, we have seen the Geelong Trades Hall Council, the Victorian Trades Hall Council, the South Coast, Labor Council, the CFMEU here in New South Wales, the NUW in Victoria, and we heard from my Deputy President, I'm a member of the Teachers Federation, and I was no more proud yesterday than when our State Council moved a motion of condemnation, a statement of condemnation of this Rudd PNG plan. And not only that, and not only that, to continue to work with people such as ourselves in the community who are trying to take this fight onto the streets and get that message out to our 90,000 members. So we may be slightly smaller here than last week, but there's still a sizable number. But the Teachers Federation is one example. It has 90,000 members across this state alone. And if we can deepen that movement, what we need, we do need more demonstrations, but what we also need is a long-term commitment, not only from people here, but we need to set up organisations in every suburb, in every industry, in every union, in every workplace, in every school, in every university to say that we're in this for the long haul, we're going to fight like crazy for the next month and three days, but beyond the election, as other people have said, we know that whether it's Abbott or Rudd, that the asylum seekers and refugees are going to pay and we're going to make sure that we're going to be out here post-election and organising like crazy to make sure that all these plans become unworkable. I think what's happening in PNG is inspiring. 
And we only have to cast our mind back two and a half years to when Julia Gillard oust and Kevin Rudd. The first thing she tried to do was to impose a similar deal on East Timor. And what did the East Timor people say? The East Timorese people said, go to hell. Go to hell. The students, the workers of East Timor, the Timorese population, many MPs, Fretland opposition, until the only person who was open to talks with Gillard was Ramos Horta. And finally, he also, also said no and set that pl plan packing. The same dynamic is possible in PNG. The solidarity that we've seen from the students in PNG, it is possible to put this deal into the garbage where it belongs. There are many actions coming up. One which is on next Friday, which will probably be overshadowed by next Saturday's protest, and that's fine, because we need more protests in the city. But Tony Burke, the Minister for Immigration now, is holding a dinner at Brighton La Sands at the Grand Roxy on Friday night, $160 a head. Most ordinary members of the Labor Party would struggle to pay that, let alone the likes of you and I. However, we have caught a demonstration outside of there. And I think it's worth us reminding Tony Burke, when he was opposition immigration minister at the tail end of the Howard government, some of the things that he actually said. And I've got a statement that he wrote in May 2007. Labor would end the so-called Pacific Solution and close the Australian detention facilities on Nauru and Manus Island. What a joke. The Howard government's use of Nauru as an immigration detention centre is not only a waste of money, it is inhumane. Australian law has no jurisdiction on Nauru, so the 2005 legislative measures to improve conditions of detainees do not apply on Nauru. That's Tony Burke in 2007. We've got to remind him of this. We've got to remind every Labor Party member. We've got to remind every trade unionist. We've got to get the word out to people. And of course, on election day, the Refugee Action Coalition will be making material to distribute as widely as possible how you can vote pro-refugee because the street rallies are important but it's also very important for us to engage in the political process around the election. Many people who aren't here today will be looking at that. And on September the 8th, the day after the election, I'm not a member of the Greens but I dearly want to see the Greens vote go up on the 7th of September. It'll be very, very important for them to hold their Senate positions, for Adam Bant to hold his seat um, in Melbourne and for whole Greenland to give Anthony Albanese a run for his money in the seat of Greenland and Diane Hiles a proud long-term a, a proud long-term refugee advocate standing against Tanya Plibersek in Sydney. Just some examples. And I think, you know, people obviously know we maybe we're not members of the Greens, but I think around the election we need to gather we need to gather a bit of momentum around that as well. So yes, the street demonstrations, yes, the support in the unions, yes, the support in every suburb, but we also need to engage with where people are at and try and bring them towards that for, for an even bigger and more vibrant movement post-election. Thanks. Thank you. So that's it. Till next week, watch Facebook, watch our website, and come, let's ruin our Tony Burke's